And it's also going to be even clearer when I bring the other book up. So that's great. Okay, well, thank you for, for waiting. Um, and I'm sorry about that. We had trouble scheduling meetings. It started at 9.30, but went until like 11.40. Um, let me just see. I think there's two people presenting today. So we can go a bit longer. Halka, you're presenting uh, Jordan and Greg, right? Mm -hmm. Is Jordan here right now? Yeah, okay, so you're all here, so there's three people. So we're good. I really wanted the slides, because there's things that without the slides, it's not gonna work as well. Um, okay, so let me recap on Fanon. And this should be about an hour, an hour and 10 minute lecture, so we're fine. And I'll talk fast at some points. And it's recording? Yeah, okay. So to recap, did you guys have a good reading week? I had an awesome reading week. It was awesome. Mostly because I was in a 30 degree weather. So I was taking a workshop. And you know, it was just warm. And you didn't have to wear all your winter clothes so you could get ready so much faster. It was like, great. The wretched of the earth, as, as I, we said before, reading week, was published in 1961. And there's something else I want to pull out here. There's an interview with Fanon's wife that I want to quote from. 1961, it was published before Fanon died in December 61. Uh, just as a, a recap, Fanon is a psychiatrist, or was a psychiatrist, a revolutionary. He was trained in France. He was born in Martinique. He worked at a hospital in Algeria during the Algerian War of Independence, uh, which, just as a refresher, was from 1954 to 1962. He's known as a key theorist of revolution, anti-racism, a critique of colonialism, and I would say a theorist of violence. I'm going to concentrate on violence for the first part of the lecture. So the Algerian War of Independence, or the Algerian Revolution, was a war between France and the FLN, the People's Revolutionary um, National Libera Liberation Front, which ran from 54 to 62, when Algeria gained its independence from France, and then a different type of violence started taking place. So what I want to talk about today I'm going to keep hitting my computer. What I want to talk about today, then, is violence, the lump and proletariat, and the new human. Now, the colonial regime was founded by force. And let me take you through this, and then I'll go to there. So Fanon's talking basically about two kinds of violence. And I'm fitting in here, I, I wanted to bring together on this slide Sorel's understanding of force and also Benjamin's understanding of violence. So he's talking about the violence of the colonial regime, what Sorel calls force. And in the case of Algeria, this is the force in the founding moment of French domination, which is 1827 to 30, and in the maintaining of French domination under direct rule from 1830 to 1962. These are Benjamin's founding and maintaining, or these are examples of Benjamin's understanding of founding and maintaining violence. Secondly, <coughs> the second kind of violence he's talking about is the counter-violence of the Algerian people fighting for independence. And he's looking at it as a dialectic of, a, of violence He's using Hegel's dialectic with Marxian sort of um, infusion, but he's looking at the counterviolence of the Algerian people fighting for independence. And here, this can kind of be matched up with Benjamin's divine, uh, when the violence breaks out, that spark of violence and mythic violence, the way it's coded then um, in terms of the liberation struggle. Now, just as a refresher, colonist colonizer, force of the state, colonized violence of resistance. And there was a term that you, um, Shaharia, there was a term you used that's um, 
Mimi's term. What was it? It's a, um, I didn't put it on here, but it's the colonized. It's another term for colonized. It's yeah, a colonialist. Colonialist, which means? Like the bourgeoisie class that benefits. From the colonizer. So it's like the, it's basically, so, the, so if you want to write down here, and I would have if I remembered, a uh, colonialist, which is the indigenous bourgeoisie that, that, is that the correct? It wasn't the indigenous, it was the occupying. Oh, it's the occupying. So it's, it's just up here, it's colonist and colonial, a colonializer and colonialist, which is the act of, which is basically the act of indigenous French nationalists and some articulated Algerian populations. It's a good thing I didn't put it down there because I had it in the other category and I'm like, it didn't seem to make sense, but good, thank you. So the colonial regime then, so are you guys clear on this? That the colonist and the colonizer are forces of the state, that's the colonial regime. Those are the terms that, that Fanon uses and the colonized are the, those who have been subject to Sorry, the force of the state. And in terms of violence, the colonist and the colonizer are using force of state. The colonized is engaged in the violence of resistance. So the colonial regime was founded by force. It owes its, its existence to force. So it's founded by violence, called force if you're using Sorel. It owes its existence to force. That's maintaining violence. And in armed struggle, and it's only for Fanon armed struggle that will overthrow the regime. So Fanon says, and in an interview after Fanon's death with Josie uh, Fanon, she says that basically oppressed and colonized people cannot free themselves other than through armed struggle. That's Fanon's position. that, and I think she says it very succinctly, oppressed and colonized people cannot free themselves other than through armed struggle. The very same people who had a, con this is on page 42, and we talked about this a little bit last week, uh, or two weeks ago, and we jumped ahead a bit. The very same people who had it constantly drummed into them that the only language they understood was force, now decide to express themselves with force. What Fanon says on page 42 is that the colonist here, that the colonist has always shown them the path they should follow to liberation. So if you take a look at page 42, and if it, the, the um, second paragraph halfway down, he says, the existence of an armed struggle is indicative that people are determined to put their faith only in violent methods. The very same people who had it constantly drummed into them that the only language they understood was that of force now decide to express themselves with force. The argument chosen by the colonized was conveyed to them by the colonist. And by an ironic twist of fate, it's now the colonized who state that the colonizer who only understands, it is the colonizer who only understands the language of force. So the colonizer was arguing that they basically had to rule with force because that's all the colonized understood. Now what you're getting is, is the dialectical return of that, Fanon says, and that the colonized are using force against the colonizer and the colonizer is accusing them of using force. Does that make sense or no? I always sound better when Fanon says it. So if you go back to page 42, because he really writes as a dialectical thinker. So when he says, the argument chosen by the colonized was conveyed to them by the colonist. That is, they learned their argument from the colonists themselves. And by a twist of fate, it's now the colonized who state that it's the colonizer who only understands the language of force. That is, that you could only fight oppression with force. So he's doing a, he's doing sort of a, a dialectic there and a synthesis. And it's probably on this 
So the existence of an armed struggle is indicative that the people are determined to put their faith only in violent methods. The very same people, and this is what the quote that I kind of um, messed up when I was explaining it. The very same people who had it constantly drummed into them that the only language they understood was that of force, now they decide to express themselves with force. Now, I would say here, if you're using Sorrel, it would be with violence. Force would be the force of the state. What this means, then, Fanon says, is that work takes on a new meaning. To work is to work towards the death of the colonist. That revolution is work. And you can see his Marxist um, sort of understanding of alienation and labor there. So work takes on a new meaning. Work is to work towards the death of the colonist. The colonized, the colonized human liberates themselves through work. The colonized, and this is a women's brigade, it's a mixed brigade actually. The colonized human liberates themselves in and through violence. It's a new understanding of violence. It's an understanding of violence that's not present in Sorel or Benjamin. That is that it's, and this is where Fernand got into trouble, okay? The idea that in order to build a new human being, you liberate yourself through violence. That violence is a way of a purifying act. It's almost like this, Benjamin's understanding of divine violence. So if you take a look, I want to talk a little bit about women in the Algerian struggle. So you've got rural and, and then I'll go back to violence, but I think this fits well here. You've got rural and urban women. He writes about it in A Dying Colonialism. Um, there's 20% of urban women joined the FLN. And 2% then, there was a lower percentage of rural women that joined. Women participated as combatants, 2% spies, weapons transporters, fundraisers, nurses, cooks. After the war, women returned to pre-war positions defined by societal, religious, and cultural values. So one of the things, that if you take a look at it, the women were very active in the Battle of Algiers. And if you haven't seen the film on the Battle of Algiers, it's on YouTube, it's really worth seeing. Fanon writes about this in terms of women carrying because men were constantly stopped by the police and the, and the military. So women were able to move around freely and smuggle weapons. And they would manipulate their personal appearance in two ways. They would hide often weapons under the veil because the French saw this as above suspicion. Or they would adopt a European uh, appearance, which to the French meant that they were adhering to French values and a way of life. So then they would carry weapons and explosives in handbags, that kind of stuff. In strollers. So they're very instrumental to the struggle. However, and this is where it gets kind of disheartening, um, the FLN attitudes towards women were not necessarily that positive. Some were, some weren't. So if you, if you take a look at this statement by an FLN commander, Alal, um, he says, and I'll read this, it's forbidden to recruit female soldiers and nurses without the zone's authorization. So the zone they're working in. In independent Algeria, the Muslim women's freedom stops at the door of her home. So, so it's okay to fight in the struggle. It's necessary. But once there's into, this pretty much sums up a lot of guerrilla warfare, women's integration. But in an independent Algeria, the Muslim woman's freedom stops at the door of her home. And then it goes on to say, women will never be equal to that of men. They'll never be equal to men. One of the things they did by 1958, there was a problem because the urban women were literate and a lot of the men fighting were illiterate, so there was a division there. One of the things they did in 1958 was deport progressive female elements 
don't know why I'm laughing at this, but it's like, they deported progressive female elements, elements to countries that, that were surrounding countries. So a large percentage of progressive female fighters were deported in 1958 by the FLN. Now, I don't know why they were deported. I mean, I, I hope it's not because they were too militant. I find that hard to believe. And I tried to look that up, but I couldn't find out anything beyond that. So women in the Algerian Revolution were very instrumental in the Battle of Algiers in terms of, and, and, the, uh, and, and fighting against the occupation in terms of carrying explosives, setting off explosives, carrying um, guns, either as a veiled subject or as a Western subject. But once the, um, once the struggle was over, it was considered they would go back to their traditional roles. And that's quite typical of armed struggle. So what Fanon argues is that in the struggle, a new militant could be trusted only when she, he, could no longer return to the colonial system. So you would have to engage in, and this is quite common in armed struggle, you would have to engage in an action in which you could no longer go back to your previous way of life in order to be trusted. So it's like a new militant's initiation was engaging in an action but they could not then leave the struggle and go back to their previous way of life. Fanon, again, this is a different understanding of violence than anyone else on the course until we get to Zizak, who develops it from Fanon. Violence is a cleansing force. It frees the indigenous person, the native, from their inferiority complex and from their despair and inaction. It makes them fearless and restores self-respect. So that, so Fanon sees violence as, as a means of creating a new human being and as a cleansing force, as a freeing force. National liberation, national renaissance, the restoration of nationhood to the people, commonwealth, whatever the headings you use may be, the new formulas introduced, decolonization for Fanon is always a violent phenomenon. It ha because the colonial society was founded in violence, violence for Fanon has to be used against the founding violence. So, that, so divine and then mythic violence used against the founding violence. And there's a quote from Malcolm X which I think is quite important, in terms of the international understanding of Fanon, Malcolm X says, in Algeria, the northern part of Africa, a revolution took place. The Algerians were revolutionists. They wanted land. France offered to let them be integrated into France. They told France to hell with France. They wanted some land, not some France. And they engaged in a bloody battle. You don't have a peaceful revolution. So Fanon's integrated into um, black power movement. You don't have a peaceful revolution. You don't have a turn, the other cheek revolution. There's no such thing as a non-violent revolution. So Malcolm X is stressing that coming from Fanon, He's stressing Fanon's point there. Now, there's a stage, Fanon says, where the colonial the violence of the colonial regime and the counter-violence of the colonized produce a homogeneity. Again, you can see his use of the Hegelian dialectic. So they produce a homogeneity. And once the colonized use counter-violence to counter what's used against them, that's the, count, that's the violence of the regime, there's a tipping point. As we said a couple of weeks ago, the tipping point in the armed struggle for, Al for Algerians was 1955, it was early on, one year after um, it started, where there's a sweeping repression of every sector of the colonized populations. It occurred just after Philipville, where 12,000 Algerian people were killed. And to refresh your memories, the Battle of Philipville 
was part of the war between France and Algerian rebels, FLN rebels. It took place August 20th, 1955, and it centered in Philipville, but there was also surrounding areas. What you had was the FLN militia with thousands of local rural Muslim peasants armed with clubs, sticks, axes, knives, pitchforks, descending upon Philipville with the intention of killing French colonialists. So you can imagine the spark of violence there if you're fighting against a regime with those kind of implements. And what happened is that the French colonialists had the French military parachute in, the French police, and then, so they, they parachuted in, they responded with artillery against clubs, sticks, axes, knives, pitchforks, and then while the and then the French police and the military stood by while the French Algerians engaged in a mass retaliation after the funeral of those who were ki killed, the French Algerians that were killed. So the end death toll was 12,000 Algerian Muslims and 71 French Algerians. And this is what Fanon sees as the point of no return. He notes that in the eyes and experience of the colonized, no commission, no legal body exists for them to report crimes to. He says when the colonized subject is tortured, when his wife is killed or raped, he complains to no one. Why? The reason, and this is on page 50, the reason is there hasn't been a single Frenchman ever brought before a French court of justice for the murder of an Algerian. There's been no single Frenchman brought before a French court of justice for the murder of an Algerian. So that's why it's not reported. Now how does Fanon, there's this, one of the cases that Fanon looks at, at the end of the book when he's looking at colonial mental disorders, and it's a really brutal case. Um, it's a case of two kids playing with their French, like so they're, Al they're Algerians, um, and they're, they're playing with their French friend. They're like, I think, eight and nine or nine and 12. And they end up killing him. They take him up into the hill and they kill him. And so Fanon is then, as, is then the psychiatrist who is, is working with the two boys that have killed the, the French boy. And he says to them, um, well, why, like, he was your friend. Why did you kill him? And they said, because there were two reasons. One is because that he was their friend, he would go with them because they played together, so they had access to him. And secondly, it was this incredible rage from a nine and 12 year old um, about the, nobody ever, what they said to Fanon is precisely what Fanon writes here, that in their experience, no French person has ever been tried for killing an Algerian. And so we, you know, so Fanon obviously is not condoning their action, but it's just this rage that builds up at a really unfair justice system. And the realization as young as nine and 12 that the system itself is never going to prosecute anybody that does an injustice against an Algerian. That, that the French, because it's a French justice system, the French citizen will always have what? Sanction to do as they please basically. So how does he define violence? How does Fanon define violence? He defines it, I try to sort of boil down some of the ways that he defines it. So he says, the violence of the colonial, this is on page 46, the violence of the colonial regime and the counter-violence of the colonized balance each other and respond to each other in extraordinary reciprocal homogeneity. What he's saying there is that there's a dialectic, that a regime founded in extreme violence is gonna be responded to in extreme violence. That the violence of the colonial regime and the counter-violence of the colonized balance each other. 
and respond to each other in this extraordinary reciprocal homogeneity. Which then said, he allows them to say that violence among the colonized will spread in proportion to the violence ex exerted by the colonial regime. That the more violence the colonial regime uses, I realize I forgot to put the mic on, that the more violence the colonial regime uses, the more violent the, the resistance struggle is going to be. So now I can stop here. Yeah. Perhaps. Okay. So at the individual level, is that mic okay? Or is it too loud? I'll stop yeah. It's all right? It's okay. It's okay. Let me know if it's too loud and I'll turn it down. Um, at the individual level, violence is a cleansing force. that it rids the colonizer of the socially constructed inferiority complex of their despairing attitude, of a passive attitude. It boldens them and restores their self-confidence. That's on 51. Then he says that even if the armed struggle has been symbolic, and even if they have been demobilized by rapid decolonization, the people have time to realize that liberation was the achievement of each and every one. So no special merit should go to the leader, that each person played a role, and that the violence enacted in the struggle lifts the people up to the level of the leader. He says that when, when the masses have used violence to achieve national liberation, the masses allow nobody to come forward as a liberator. That nobody comes forward as the single leader. Because all have been involved. The founding violence of the colonialists can only be brought to a halt when the regime is destroyed. And I read you the quote from um, Josie Fanon before that is, oppression and colonized people cannot free themselves other than through armed struggle. She's being interviewed about, she was a journalist. After Fanon died, she went on to do quite a bit of journalist work, and she ended up committing suicide because she couldn't stand what had become of the Algerian Revolution, basically. She also says something very interesting. She says, many wonder why Fanon went to Algeria. Like what relationship there could be between a man from Martinique and Algeria? And she says the answer is simple. She says there exists a fundamental fraternity between all colonized people and between people colonized by the same foreign power. So remember that in Martinique the foreign power was France as well. But what's I think really important there is that there exists a fundamental fraternity between all colonized people and that's precisely what, Mar what uh, Malcolm X picks up when he's using Fanon in terms of a, of a violent struggle being necessary. As we know from before, but he reiterates this on page 50, that the arrival of the French colonialists signified the death of the indigenous society. It signified the cultural lethargy and petrification of the individual. That is a freezing of a personhood development, which allows him then to say, for the colonized, life can only materialize from the rotting cadaver of the colonialist. For Fanon, the colonized, or for the colonized, Fanon says, this violence has positive formative features. It's their only work. The armed struggle unites and mobilizes. It provides a common cause, a national identity. Now, the reason this is so important is it's what then other armed struggles picked up. Okay? So what Fanon is saying is that it provides a common cause, a national identity, a sense of focus, a mobilization, a collective history. 
it unites the individual and the group. It's get after Fanon wrote this, it's been seen as sort of the main features of national liberation. So the the violence of the liberation struggle is unifying first in the armed struggle, which in a sense is the beginning, begins as a divine struggle and a mythic struggle. And then it turns to building, fighting poverty and underdevelopment in the independent stage, where it turns into what, what Benjamin would call founding and maintaining violence. So if you want to map the liberation struggle. Um, I would map it this way, that, that when he talks about Phillipsville, that's like this divine moment, which there's no turning back. Then you use that as, as a mythic moment of resistance, and it mobilizes people, and you use your past history as, a, as mythic moments of resistance. Once you've won the independence war, once you've won the independence struggle and you start rebuilding the country, you end up moving into then a new form of founding violence, to use Benjamin, and new forms of maintaining this founding violence. So I mean, if you were doing a, a paper on violence, I mean, logically, I would go with Sorel, Benjamin, Fanon, Zizak, and then I would try to figure out who else to put in there. Probably Cesare. Uh, Cesa so that would be like five authors, second term, that talk about violence. Um, and I would recommend those. There's others, but those are sort of the key, the key ones. So for, what Fanon says and what gets picked up by the Black Power Movement in the US, uh, which gets used by that, which gets used in other liberation struggles in Africa um, and Latin America, is that at the collective level, violence unifies the people. At the individual level, it cleanses. It rids the colonized of their socially constructed and system-maintained inferiority complex of their despair. And it raises, as, as I said here, it raises and hoists the people up to the level of the leader. Then Fanon goes on to document on page 54, 57, and 59 what happens when at independence what was formerly a colony becomes economically, becomes politically independent but economically a dependent country. He says once independence is won, and to use uh, Benjamin, you have the founding and maintaining of a new regime, but you have the founding and maintaining of a new regime without a developed infrastructure. Because the main industry in many of these countries is extraction, extraction of natural resources. So remember a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a whole, you saw visual images that corresponded to um, these words in the text. It was from this section where he's talking about the extraction of raw material and neocolonialism. So you end up then with an infrastructure that's an extractive infrastructure that basically it's been set up to haul the natural resources out. You have a population that doesn't have the required knowledge. The colonial regime does one of two things. So that would be the French, the French regime. It either exits and takes its technicians with it and its capital. And just as an aside there, the flight of capital is one of the most constants in the phenomena of decolonization. So it either exits with its technicians and its capital, or it makes a deal with the emergent national bourgeoisie. And as soon as it makes a deal with the emergent national bourgeoisie, this newly independent country becomes dependent again. But it becomes dependent, it becomes economically dependent with the veneer of political independence. Because when you're economically dependent, it's hard to be politically independent. So it then goes from a colonial situation to what Fanon and others call a neo-colonial situation. 
That is, it's economically tied and politically officially independent. If you take a look at page 55, I mean, it's actually quite heartbreaking. And one of the things, because Fanon studied as a phenomenologist, he's able, he's, he's actually able to get in, a, in, in his writing the sort of phenomenologically heartbreaking occurrence that happens post, you know, post independence. He says, on 56 actually, he says, men and women, young and old, commit themselves enthusiastically to what amounts to forced labor, and they dedicate themselves to the nation. The country's under new management, but in actual fact, everything has to be started over from scratch. It has to be rethought. Because the colonial regime was only interested in certain riches, certain natural resources, that's the way the economy is set up. And then he goes on, and I would read page, I won't read it, but you can read page 57, where he talks, he says, for centuries the capitalists have behaved like real war criminals in the underdeveloped world. Deportation, he says, Nazism had to answer for its crimes. It's time that Europe answers for the crimes that it's committed in African countries. And if you remember um, the seven minute sort of excerpt we saw, from a narration of Fanon's book a couple of weeks ago. It's from this section. So there's a gigantic effort of a people who's fought a liberation struggle, a people who have nothing. It's on page 54. He says, and this is a phenomenology, understand, phenomenological understanding of it. These famished individuals, it's the last three lines, four lines. These famished individuals are required to undergo a regime of austerity. These atrophied muscles are required to work out of all proportion. There's an autotactic, uh, arctic, an antarctic regime, I'm trying to say, uh, a chaos, an autarkic regime is established and each state then has pitiful resources at its disposal. So he's saying people that have fought and worn themselves out during the national liberation struggle and gone without food and, and won, then are forced because of their commitment to the national state and their, national, and, and their new government and their country, are then forced to again give this incredible effort. And at this point, they're depleted. So you're starting a new society with people who are exhausted. I mean, you're starting a new society with people who have, have and Fanon's very good in terms of the phenomenology of the body, you're starting a new society with people who have taken their body to the absolute limit in fighting the colonial war. He talks, he talks about the dual consciousness on page 59. I think that becomes, that becomes really important. He says, the aid that Europe should be paying um, African countries for all the all the raw material that's hauled out of there and the labor that's exploited. He says such aid on page 59 must be considered the final stage of what he calls a dual consciousness. And this dual consciousness is an ethics for Fanon. It's a consciousness of the colonized that it's their due. It's a consciousness of, in Algeria's case, the French colonizer, but it's their due the French colonized, the Algerians, that it's their due, they are owed this. And it's the consciousness of the French capitalist powers that they must pay up. So it's a dual consciousness that as a colonial subject, now an independent subject, it is your due, your country's due, to have payments made for the resources extracted. And as a capitalist power, it's your responsibility to pay up. It's owed. It's not an act of generosity. Rather, it's what's owed. And that's on 59. As soon as the capitalists know, and they're obviously the first to know that their government's preparing to decolonize, they withdraw all their capital from the colony. What you've got is a spectacular flight of capital. It's one of the most constant phenomenon 
phenomena of decolonization. So Fanon is saying there that decol you can, can't tell. One of the reasons that decolonization isn't working is because it never has a chance, because the capital is just pulled out. But the Western powers, rather than recognizing their responsibility and their obligation to pay up, just pull everything up. So upon independence in Algeria in 1962, 900,000 European Algerians, heads north, fled to France. And they fled to France because, and they pulled their capital out. And France pulled its capital out. They fled to France in fear of the FLN's revenge. They left within a few months. The French government, it was noted, was, was unprepared for the refugees coming in. And so it caused turmoil both in France and in Algeria. The majority of the Algerian Muslims who worked for the French in the army were disarmed and they were left behind. We talked about this last week. They were left behind with the protection of a treaty between French and Algerian authorities. And the treaty said that no action would be taken against them. However, the Harkis, in particular, because they were auxiliaries in the French army, were regarded as traitors by the FLN. And between 50,000 and 150,000 Harkis and family members were murdered by the FLN, or lynch mobs, after being tortured and were abducted and tortured. So all of a sudden you've got this terrible, you've got a terrible situation. Um, and that is that, you know, the FLL is one liber FLN is one liberation struggle. They've signed a treaty saying no harm will come to Algerian French, or Algerian citizens, or not French citizens, but Algerians, who fought against the FLN in the Liberation War. And they just lied. So then once the treaty is signed and the French pull out, they end up killing those who fought against them, um, rather than re-educating, rather than integrating. But they, the violence then turns inward again. And it's really a problem. And it's really a problem post-liberation, post what you do. And Zimbabwe got into the same problem. Um, what you do with those who fought on the other side. Um, if you read, interestingly, the workshop that I took in uh, Florida over reading week quoted Nelson Mandela a lot. And it was a meditation and forgiveness workshop. And it quoted Mandela a lot in terms of truth and reconciliation in South Africa and the idea that, you, that it's possible to forgive those who have oppressed you. So Mandela changed. I mean, he, he, coming later in history and seeing what had happened after revolutions had been won and after the liberation struggle ended, um, and also in a different historical context, he was very, he and Desmond Tutu were very focused on reconciliation, forgiveness and reconciliation and building a new society. It hasn't gone so well. However, it's almost, there, there's other economic problems, et cetera, that have happened, but it's gone much better than what happened in Algeria and what happened in, in Zimbabwe. I mean, one of the things that uh, Nelson Mandela did, which is interesting, is at his, uh, at his, um, swearing in as president, the person who was his jailer for, I think he was in jail for 29 years or 25, six years, his jailer, one of his main jailers was invited to it. Um, they become friends, like one of the guards. So that's kind of, and that was kind of, he also integrated the country through, you know, soccer and things like that. He, he, he worked in a way to sort of integrate previous um, factions. The only problem was, was one of the problems was his wife, Winnie Mandela, who seemed to have her own sort of side group that was um, a gang. So let's talk about the lumpen proletariat, because Fanon gives us one of the first, and I would say best, understandings of the lumpen proletariat. So we've done violence. We're going to talk about the lumpen proletariat. We're going to, and we're going to talk about the new human being. So the lumpen proletariat is Marx's term. Marx's term. Uh, for Marx, the lumpen proletariat lacked class consciousness. 
Now for Fanon, and I would say maybe influenced by Benjamin's understanding of divine violence, the lumber proletariat gets a class consciousness, becomes conscious, be and also influenced by his understanding of Hegel and the situation on the ground, becomes class conscious, becomes a, moves from an in itself to a for itself. So the lumber proletariat are those who have no place. They're discarded by the colonial regime. They're outside of the society. They tend to be land in Algeria. They're landless peasants who have come from the country to the city. And for Fanon, it's the landless peasants and the lumpen proletariat who make the revolution. They're going to make the revolution. He sees the lumpen proletariat as the urban extension of the landless peasantry. So remember, the proletariat has a structural relation to the means of production. Okay, It's their labor that contributes to the, the means of production. They're structurally related to it. It's their labor that's exploited. Um, the lumpen proletariat does not have a structural position to the, in relation to the means of production. What they are, are, are those who are spewed out. And he lists them at some point. He says, okay, drug dealers. He goes through, the, you know, he goes through all those who are not part of producing for, for the, the uh, colonial country. So it's like drug dealers, pimps, um, petty criminals, prostitutes. Who else is he? He lists, um, he's got about 10 that he lists. So it's, and, and, those, and those who don't fall into that category, those categories, um, but people that just don't have a place. They're living outside in the shanty towns. They're not integrated within the capitalist system. They've been, they've been thrown out. So the land of peasants, now I'll go back, because I want to read Atu's after. So the, let me read Atu's first and then, no, I'll do this first. So the landless peasants, on page 66, make up, it's the landless peasants who then make up the lumpen proletariat. What they do is they leave the country districts and they rush towards the towns and they crowd into tin shack settlements that are on the outskirts and they try to make their way into the ports and cities founded by colonial domination, and they get stuck. So the material symbol of the social structure confronting peasants who remain in the country is land. And the material symbol of, these, of the structure and social question confronting the lumpen proletariat is bread. They're starving. So what Fanon says is, okay, the material symbol of the social structure and the question confronting peasants who remain on the land, in the country is the land. The material symbol of the social question and the structure confronting the lumpen proletariat is bread. They're starving. So Atu Sishiyotu, I talked about Atu's work last week, Fanon's dialectic of experience. Um, I think I mentioned I studied with Atu. So Atu says this of the lumpen proletariat. The lumpen proletariat, faced with the most basic of human needs, is the class to whose members every access to the treacherous advantages of colonialism and modernity is barred, and who are the resentful witnesses to the privileged servitude of the national bourgeoisie and the proletariat they're the living accusation against the distributive injustice of a colonial order. The class in colonial society which has no place. It has no place in the scheme of graduations, gradations, sorry. In the lumpen proletariat, the immediacy of material need and social consciousness integrates, which integrates the rebellion in the rural district, finds its urban equivalent. <coughs> So what you've got are the peasants in the rural districts and the lumpen proletariat in the urban. So the lumpen proletariat in the immediate sea, or sorry, in the lumpen proletariat, the immediacy of material need for bread and social consciousness 
inaugurates the rebellion in the rural districts, sorry, which inaugurates its rebellion in the real, rural districts finds its urban equivalent. So in the rural, there's a, a demand for land. In the urban, there's a demand for basic food. I'll take another run of that. In the lumpy proletariat, the immediacy of material need and social consciousness, which inaugurates the rebellion in the rural district, finds its urban equivalent. And that's on page 162 of Atu's book, Fanon's Dialectic of Experience. And I think there's a PDF of it readily available. Um, so if you're interested in it, it's a great book. And he is sort of the leading um, international Fanon scholar. and comes from a Hegelian phenomenological Marxist and critical theory position. Now the insurrection, which starts in the rural areas, it's introduced, now, so on page 80, Fanon is sort of giving a, um, a depiction and a phenomenological understanding of where, this, where resistance starts, right? So he says, the insurrection, which starts in the rural areas, is introduced into the towns by that faction of the peasantry blocked at the urban periphery, those who can't get in, those who still have not found a single bone to gnaw in the colonial system, those who are basically starving. And it's these people, after fighting the war of independence, that are gonna build a new country. That's why what he says about being completely exhausted and exhausted down through your muscles and then and then you know giving more to the building of a new of a new country. These men and women force off the family land by the growing population in the countryside and by colonial expro expropriation, expropriation circle the towns tirelessly, hoping that they're going to be let in. But they're never let in. It's among these masses, in the people of the shanty towns, in the lump of proletariat that the insurrection will find its urban spearhead. At a certain point, there'll be this spark of what Benjamin would call divine violence where it can't be taken anymore. So divine violence, you might remember this slide image from Benjamin, um, the lecture on Benjamin. And just to, just to refresh her, divine violence is violence outside the law. It's spontaneous. It can be called sovereign violence. So according to Benjamin, and, and Fanon is seeing the lumpen proletariat through an understanding of Benjamin's divine violence, I would argue. Divine violence is violence outside the law. It's spontaneous. It may be called sovereign violence, that is, it's standing on its own. It's independent of the system. The Lumpen proletariat, this cohort of starving humans, divorced from tribe and clan, constitutes one of the most spontaneously and radically revolutionary forces of colonized people. Fanon was the first to see this, that it's not those who have a position in the mode of production, but have a position or structurally linked to the means of production. Rather, it's those who are completely outside. Those that Marx actually had written off, which is why, again, Fanon is seen as such a revolutionary thinker. The formation of the lumpen proletariat is a phenomenon which is governed by its own logic. And neither the overzealousness of the missionaries or decrees from the central authorities can check its growth. It's outside the system. And it keeps and it keeps increasing. The system, the system keeps faltering, spewing people out. It keeps increasing. He says, and this is the Battle of Algiers. Um, that's the the film. One of the film posters. These vagrants, these second class citizens, find their way back to the nation thanks to their decisive militant action. It is through action, to go back to Hegel, it's through action and rising up from being in itself to acting as a for itself that then returns those that have been kicked out, those who are on the outside, back, back to the nation. And it's through their militant action that they become integrated. 
He says on 82, these jobless, these species of subhumans define, rede redeem themselves and redefine themselves in their own eyes and before history. They do it through militant action, according to Kanan. So for, for, for Fanon, violence is humans recreating themselves. Violence is man recreating himself, is what he says. He stresses that it's crucial to create a new human. Now, you're going to say, OK, it's crucial to create a new, a new human. And partly what, what Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu did in terms of truth and reconciliation and forgiveness was a real attempt to do this. Okay, just to, you know, to, to try and create a new human being. They, I mean, and, and they learned. They learned from other. They learned, they learned from the Zimbabwe struggle. They learned from the Mozambique struggle. They learned from the struggle in uh, Algeria. What they learned was, if you don't do that, you end up in a cycle. I mean, Algeria has just gone through an extensive cycle of post-colonial violence, ending in 2011. Um, so in a sense, if you don't, and, and you also end up, if you don't sort of do something different, is you end up with a liberation um, faction that has led the struggle against the colonial power, coming to power, and then doing what could be seen as a, a genocide against its opposition. It's what you had in Algeria. So Fanon was not alive at that point, and partly that's one of the things that led to Josie Fanon's suicide. Um, violence is man recreating himself. And we talked last week in, in um, tutorial about like if you grounded yourself in violence, then once the struggle's over, how do you put a stop to that violence? And I mean, Fanon didn't really have an answer for that um, because he didn't live long enough. It's probably the um, Mandela and Tutu did develop an answer, um, but there's a whole history then. I mean, that's that's like at the end of the 80s, 90s. So there's a whole history of 30 years to see um, the problem with violence that then gets turned inward again against opposition. So Fanon stresses that it's crucial to create a new human. One that's not grounded in European values and practices. And he says we have to create a new human that's not grounded in European values and practices. He says when I look for a human in European lifestyles and technology, I see a constant denial of human, an avalanche of murders. So he's, in, you know, he's indicting Western Europe. He's also indicting America, much like uh, Annie Cesar did. And he's, he says that he turns to America and he says, America has caught up to Europe, page 237. The United States of America has become a monster where the flawless or where the flaws, sickness, and inhumanity of Europe have reached frightening proportions. So if you go to 237, this is his conclusion. So in 236, he says, let us decide not to imitate Europe. And let us tense our muscles and our brains. One of the things that Fanon does is integrate the sort of entire body, right? So you find he, he talks about muscles and he talks about brains throughout, that it's, a, that it's an embodied struggle. Let us tense our muscles and our brains in a new direction. Let us endeavor to invent a man in full, something which Europe has been incapable of doing. And he says that the third world, because he's what we would call the global south today, um, but he says the third world has to start over, a new history of human beings. Bottom of page 238. Which takes account of Europe's crimes. 
And he says, the most hideous of which had been committed at the very heart of man, the pathological dismembering of his functions, the erosion of his unity in the context of the community, the fracture, the stratification, and the blood tensions fed by class, and finally on the immense scale of humanity. The racial hatred, slavery, exploitation, and above all, the bloodless genocide where one and a half billion men have been written off. He says that we have to, we have to start a new history of human beings. And in that new history, we have to take account of what Europe and, and, the Ameri and America, the United States, has done to the third world. And the last line of the book, page 239, Hunan says, he says, let us endeavor, that's not the last line, but I'll read that again. Let us endeavor to invent a human in full, something which Europe has been incapable of doing. 236, and 239, he says, for ourselves and for humanity, we must make a new start, develop a new way of thinking, and endeavor to create a new human. And then he ends there, and then he does. Not that long afterwards. So, which is really, I mean, sad for many number of reasons. But I think Fanon, with his background in psychoanalysis and his training as a doctor and his experience in Martinique and Algeria and in France, would have had some way of understanding after the revolution and when you're founding a new society and you're creating a new human being, how to go about doing that. I mean, he makes, he makes a number of suggestions and he says we can't follow the same old pattern because the same old pattern didn't, didn't work. That we have to do something new, but he doesn't, of course, provide what new can be done. He says on page two, uh, 236, when I look for man in Europe, when I look for man in European lifestyles and technology, I see a constant denial of man. I see an avalanche of murders. So he's, he's saying we have to do something new, and it's very difficult to create a new human being at the point where you're exhausted from struggle, at the point where you have raised up and become a for itself, engaged in its extreme violent acts to fight an extremely violent regime and then all of a sudden you're in a peaceful society and there's and you've got there's no way of sort of stopping stopping the violence from continuing against those who were seen as traitors of the Algerian revolution so that becomes a problem and as I said last week the the Algerian civil war then ran from 1991 when a group called the Islamic Salvation Front, the FIS, was democratically, was going to be democratically elected and the FLN closed, closed it down, closed down the elections, um, attempted to and did crush the, the movement. And it lasted until 2002. So you've got then from 1992 until 2011, a state of emergency announced and, la and, and held for 19 years. So from 1992 to 2011, there's a state of emergency. And there's a definite message that opposition, that legitimate opposition is not gonna be allowed. The um, Islamic Salvation Front was seen as being enormously popular and new, and it was going to win in parliamentary elections. What happened is the FLN canceled the elections, and the military took control of the government in, 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 and backed the FLN. So what you've got then, if you want to put this in, in Benjamin's terms, you've got divine violence setting off you know, real resistance and fighting by the London proletariat and the landless peasants and the peasants. Um, you've got independence and you've got what carries into independence is the mythic aspect of the struggle, how it started, how it was carried through, the roles people played, the mythic um, role of different leaders. And then you've got 
That, that ends. Now the FLN has state power. They've got the problem of the infrastructure exiting. They've got the problem of the technicians and the experts going. Um, they also have the fear. I don't know what their fear doesn't necessarily make that much sense, but uh, those who have fought with the French side that were Algerian uh, Muslims, the Harkis, staying in the country, and they ended up killing them. So you've got like the founding of a state then in violence, and you've got the extreme maintaining of the state through the, the 19, you know, up until, and then when you've got democratic elections and another political party is going to be elected, um, you've got a state of emergency the last 19 years. So, so part of the problem is what you've got is a violent colonial society backed up by the French military and police um, and colonialists on the ground. And then you've got a post-colonial society that is backed up by militias that are supporting the FLN. And so I think for, I mean, I mean what, what uh, Josie Fanon says is Fanon would have been you know, extremely, extremely disappointed at what happened. I was trying to see where she says that, but, but she says that he would have been surprised, he would have been extremely disappointed, and that he wouldn't have been able to watch it. Um, and she does this interview when she's at a, she was invited to the United Nations Special Committee Against Apartheid, and this was in 78, um, at Howard University African American Center, and she does the interview. Okay, let's stop there. Um, before we go for break, because we got three people presenting, so we're we're still pretty tight on schedule. It's about three minutes after one. Um, and I tried to go through the lecture fairly quickly so we could be on schedule, given that it took a, a half an hour late before starting. Um, are there any comments or questions? Or do you want to do those in the, in the tutorial? OK, so take a 15-minute ba break. Be back at uh, 120. Is that 15 minutes? OK, 118. We'll be back at 118, and we'll start the tutorial for the three presenters.